It's easy to see that the world is headed toward a time of crisis, but what many don't realise is that all the things that we see happening around us today were previously revealed to us by God in His Word. Jesus said, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that, when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Bible prophecy tells us what's going on in the world today, as well as what we can expect in the future. Stay tuned as we unravel the prophecies of Scripture to see just how accurate the Bible is. Then we'll take a look at what God has said is yet to come. Hi, I'm Etienne and I'll be your host as we learn about the final crisis. In the year 603 BC and recorded in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was given a dream in which God revealed the rise and fall of the major kingdoms of Europe. He beheld a statue of many metals, each one signifying the rise of a new kingdom, starting with Babylon and ending with the second coming of Jesus. Speaking of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, God revealed, You are this head of gold, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. In Daniel chapter 7, a second prophecy is given, but this time God uses beasts which rise out of the sea to represent each kingdom. The purpose of this second prophecy is to give greater details to what God had already revealed, especially regarding the events that would occur after the reign of the Roman Empire, which as we will see, was the Iron Kingdom. As we compare Nebuchadnezzar's dream with Daniel's vision, we find that the head of gold, as well as the lion, represent Babylon. The chest and arms of silver and the corresponding bear represent Medo-Persia. The waist and thighs of brass and the leopard beast represent Greece. The legs of iron and the terrible beast with iron teeth represent Rome. The feet of iron mixed with clay and the ten horns of the terrible beast are the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. And finally, the great stone is the everlasting kingdom, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we can see from these prophecies, we're quite literally living in the toenails of time. As a matter of fact, many of the prophecies of scripture have only one detail left to be fulfilled, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. But before we get to that, I would like for us to have a look at a new power that is brought to view in Daniel chapter seven, the little horn. This power is of key significance as it is also the first beast of Revelation 13, whose mark the whole world will soon be forced to receive. Daniel chapter 7 and verses 20 to 25 gives us six key descriptors from which we can identify this power. It comes to power out of the ten divisions of Rome, but it's different to them. It subdues three of these divisions. It reigns for a time, which is one year, times two years, and the dividing of time, half a year, giving us three and a half years, which is 1260 prophetic days, according to the ancient Jewish reckoning of a year, in which each year was 360 days. Ezekiel 4.6 says, I have appointed thee each day for a year, and so this power will reign for 1260 literal years. It makes war with the saints and prevails against them, it speaks great words against the Most High, and it thinks to change God's times and laws. The question now is, what power fits this description completely? History shows us that the Roman Catholic Church, also known as the Papacy, is the only power to fulfill all of these identifying features. It came up among the ten divisions of Rome and was different in that it is a religious as well as a political power. It was instrumental in the downfall of the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths who were the last to fall in the year 538. It ruled for 1260 years from the time of Justinian's decree in 538 which gave supremacy to the Bishop of Rome and marked the beginning of its political reign until 1798 when Pope Pius VI was captured by the French General Berthier and the papal government was abolished. During its 1260 year reign, it is estimated to have put to death over 100 million innocent Christians who did not submit to its authority. Others were fined, excommunicated or imprisoned. Most of the Protestant reformers lost their lives in their attempts to reform the church and give the Bible to the people in their common language. In claiming the power to forgive sins, handing out indulgences and taking the titles Lord God the Pope and Holy Father, the Pope endeavours to take the place of God and by doing so is speaking words against the Most High. Finally, and most significantly, the Church thought to change God's times and laws. It did this when in the year 364 AD at the Council of Laodicea, the Catholic Church changed the only law which relates to time, the Sabbath 
from the seventh day of the week, which is our Saturday, to the first day, Sunday. In asking which day is the Sabbath, the Catholic Church accurately states Saturday is the Sabbath. So then why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? The Church states because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And this is why today most Christians worship on Sunday instead of the Biblical Sabbath. However, we do not find instruction for this anywhere in the Bible. At this point, I would also like to make mention that although the Scriptures identify the Catholic Church as the Antichrist, God has many faithful believers within this institution that He acknowledges as His own. However, we are now living in a time in which God is calling His faithful people, whom He loves dearly, out of these fallen churches. You can read more about this in Revelation 18, verses 1 through 4. Now we come to Revelation chapter 13, which introduces us to prophecies which relate directly to us today. The first beast in this chapter carries the same identifying features as the little horn, and so we can accurately identify it as the Catholic Church. In verse 5 it says that this beast continues for 42 months. This is the same as the three and a half years, or 1260 days, of the little horn of Daniel 7. If we now fast forward to verse 16, we realise that it is the mark of this religious system that will be placed upon those who worship it or its image. When speaking of the mark of the beast, many think of the number 666. However, very few have the correct understanding of what this number actually represents. Revelation 13 and verse 18 says that it is the number of the beast as well as the number of a man. The Douay Bible states that this passage could be understood to mean the numeral letters of his name shall make up his number. If we take one of the Pope's titles, Vicarius Philly Day, meaning Vicar of the Son of God, and calculate the sum of the numbers, we can find the number 666. Each letter has a Roman numeral value. Those letters which do not exist in Roman numerals get the value of zero. This may seem an odd thing to do, but the practice of representing names as numbers was commonly done in ancient times. Returning to the first beast of Revelation 13, we are told that its deadly wound would be healed. Are we seeing this today? Is the Catholic Church regaining the power that it lost? We've seen how the Catholic Church lost its power during the French Revolution in 1798, and I believe that today we are very much seeing the healing of this wound. In 2015, Pope Francis released his encyclical on climate change, Laudato Si, where he outlined the necessary changes we would have to make to save the planet from an impending catastrophe. Since then, his encyclical has been presented to the UN, the US Congress, President Trump and the Paris Summit. All over the world he is receiving praise as a moral authority on this issue. Thea Ormerod in ABC Religion and Ethics from May 2020 commented, the timing of the commemorative global Laudato Sea Week couldn't be more fitting for those of us promoting an economic recovery from COVID-19 that tackles unemployment, rebuilds a resilient economy and addresses climate change all at the same time. The reminder of this historic encyclical adds Francis's moral authority to the case made by concerned Australian economists regarding how this practically can be done. Further to this, in highlights from Joe Biden's vision for America, we can find this statement. In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis directed the global community to raise awareness about the growing climate change crisis. Climate change threatens communities across the country, from beachfront coastal towns to rural farms in the heartland. Joe's plan will tackle climate change and pollution to protect our communities. In addition to his leadership in climate change, the Pope has also been calling all nations and religions to unity in our efforts against COVID-19. For this, he set aside May 14, 2020 as an international day of prayer for all faiths and religions. The great basis for the Pope's call to unity has been for the sake of the common good. This was reflected to a great degree in his most recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which was released on October 4, 2020. In this encyclical, he essentially outlines the tenets of Catholic social doctrine, the core of which is the idea that any individual right which goes against what is deemed to be for the common good should be restricted. This is a global socialist agenda, not unlike the Great Reset that has been promoted by the World Economic Forum and is being developed and implemented even now for the sake of the common good of our planet. Like Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti has received just as much praise from world leaders. 
If we expect to see the whole world wander after the beast, then we expect not only to see a certain level of cooperation between nations, but also between faiths and religions. Over the past few decades, most of the major Protestant churches have signed unity agreements with the papacy. In a 2017 article in The Guardian, we read that Catholic and Protestant leaders have stressed their mutual bonds 500 years after the start of the Reformation, with the Pope declaring that Catholics and Protestants were now enjoying a relationship of true fraternity based on mutual understanding, trust and cooperation. On October 31, 2016, the Lutheran Church signed a joint declaration with the Catholic Church, putting an end to the Reformation that was started by Martin Luther 500 years earlier. In February 2019, Pope Francis met with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, the leader of Sunni Islam, to sign a declaration of fraternity calling for peace and cooperation between faiths and nations. On the surface, the Pope's ideals appear very wholesome. However, the Bible tells us that the motives behind it are quite sinister. These global movements are leading us toward a socialist agenda headed by a dictatorship that will tell us how we should act, what we should say, and how we should worship. All of these movements are a direct fulfillment of Revelation 13. The influence of the Catholic Church has been rapidly growing as its wound is healing, and we can expect its power to continue to grow until the whole world is wandering after the beast. The mark of the beast has become a topic of great interest recently, especially with the pandemic and anticipation of a coming vaccine. However, the mark is not a vaccine, neither is it a microchip or barcode. It's not a physical mark, but rather an invisible representation of who we worship. Having already identified the Catholic Church as the beast, it's much easier to figure out what its mark is, as the Catholic Church openly states it. Regarding the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first, H.F. Thomas, the Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, wrote, Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. It could not have been otherwise, as none in those days would have dreamed of doing anything in matters spiritual, ecclesiastical and religious without her. This act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Sunday observance, when it's enforced by law, is the mark of the beast. When such legislation is passed, those who refuse to obey will lose their ability to buy and sell and will ultimately face the threat of death. However, those who do obey will receive the mark of the beast. We worship whoever we serve and we serve whoever we obey. If we obey the Catholic Church by keeping holy her day in place of God's Sabbath, then we are worshipping and serving the beast. However, if we keep the Sabbath day holy according to the commandment, then we are worshipping God and serving him. Right now, Sunday rest laws as a means of reducing greenhouse emissions are being urged by many as a necessary step in combating climate change. Others are supporting the idea to encourage family rest and worship time. At least 11 countries around the world implemented Sunday rest laws to combat COVID-19. Catholics, Protestants and atheists alike are uniting on the point of a Sunday rest law for the sake of the common good. It's only a matter of time before it becomes a reality. In the Pope's 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, he emphasised the need for a global rest day on Sunday. And so the day of rest, centred on Eucharist, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to a greater concern for nature and the poor. The reality of Sunday laws is becoming more and more obvious with each passing day. The Bible hasn't been wrong in any of its predictions so far, so we can trust that this yet unfulfilled prophecy will come to pass. This now brings us to the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13, who is said to rise up from the earth and eventually speak as a dragon. The lamb is a symbol for Jesus, and the dragon represents Satan, and so this power will appear to be based on Christian principles, but will ultimately speak like Satan. Seas and prophecy represent populous places, so the earth, from where this beast comes, represents a relatively unpopulated part of the world. In Revelation chapter 12 and verses 14 through 16, we read that the earth would help the woman, which represents God's people, who were fleeing the persecution of the Catholic Church toward the end of the 1260 years, which is prior to 1798. We are told that this lamb-like beast will exercise all the power of the beast that came before it, which we know is the Catholic Church. When we look through history, we see that the Church forced all people to worship according to its dictates and persecuted those who refused to obey. 
And so we can expect to see this same level of intolerance come from this new power. If we are to summarise these points, the Lamblight Beast is a nation that is founded just prior to 1798, appears to be based on Christian principles, and arose in a part of the world that was not so heavily populated. If this beast is to force the whole world to worship the first beast and receive its mark, then it must have the power to enforce its dictates. There is only one world superpower who could accomplish such a task and who also fulfills each of these criteria, the United States of America. And so we can see that it is the United States of America that will ultimately lead in the enforcement of Sunday worship laws. As time progresses, we can expect to see further developments in the union of church and state, and this particular aspect of prophecy we are already seeing rapidly fulfilled. But this certainly does beg the question of how we get from where we are now to the whole world being forced into religious worship. The Bible gives us the answer to this in Revelation 13 and verses 13 and 14. Here we are told that we will see great wonders and miracles, even fire coming down from heaven. It will be on the basis of these supernatural occurrences that people will be called to worship the beast. However, Jesus warned us about false Christs and false prophets that would come working wonders. Not every supernatural occurrence is from God, and all things must be tested by the scriptures. As a matter of fact, the crowning act in Satan's deception will be when he comes as a false Christ to convince the world of a change in the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday in support of these fallen churches. However, despite his efforts, Satan won't be allowed to mimic Jesus coming fully, and it's for this reason that it's important that we understand what the second coming will look like. Just as the mark will be placed on those who worship the beast or its image, God also has a seal that he will place on his people. In Revelation 14 and verse 12, we are told that God's saints are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. In Isaiah 8 verse 16, we read that God will seal his law among his disciples. If the mark of the beast is Sunday observance, then it makes sense to find God's seal in the Sabbath commandment at the heart of his law. And indeed, we do find it there. A monarch seal contains three key identifiers, their name, title, and dominion. And the only place in the Bible that we find these three things as they relate to God is in the fourth commandment. For in six days, the Lord, his name, made, his title is creator, heaven and earth, the seas and all that in them is, his dominion, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The only commandment in the law that people disagree on today is the Sabbath, yet this is where we find God's seal. The conflict between Christ and Satan is one of worship. Satan desires to be like God, receiving honour and praise, and to do this he has created a false system of worship with false laws. Today we must decide whether we will worship God and keep his commandments, or whether we will worship Satan by keeping his false Sabbath. Now we come to the final scene of prophecy, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus' first coming was as a servant to reveal to us the love of God and reconcile us to heaven by taking the punishment for our sin. When he comes again, it is as King of kings and Lord of lords to put an end to sin, suffering and death for those who follow and trust him. Christ returns at earth's darkest hour to save his people and the Bible tells us exactly what his coming will be like. It will be as lightning that flashes from east to west. Every eye will see him. All the angels will be with him. The whole world will shake at his presence. It will be with great noise. The dead saints will rise from their graves. The living saints will be changed from mortal bodies to that of immortal health and youth. Together the saints will rise above the earth to meet the Lord in the air, while the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Nothing about the second coming is a secret. All will see and hear it. While the righteous will be taken to heaven, the wicked will die to await their judgment at the end of the millennium. No eternal torture awaits those who have rejected God's grace. Eternal death will be their final reward. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, not eternal life in hell. It's Satan's desire to misrepresent the character of God, to blame him for all the evils in the world, and to represent him as harsh and unloving in order to turn people away from him and justify his own rebellion in the sight of the universe. There is no reason for God to torment people in hell for an eternity. 
It's God's plan to cleanse the universe from all sin and sinners. Nothing will exist there that could mar its perfect peace and harmony. When mankind fell into sin, we joined with Satan in his rebellion against heaven. By doing this, we took upon ourselves the curse of sin with all its guilt and suffering. Sin is a law of selfishness. It began with Satan's desire to be worshipped and has been the condition of humanity since it entered the world. As with any kingdom, heaven has a law. It is the Ten Commandments that form the foundation of the heavenly government, and at the heart of this law is the command to love. As we are now sick with sin, we cannot enter heaven. If we reject the gift of salvation and refuse obedience to heaven's law, God will have no choice but to do the most merciful thing he can and blot us from existence. However, God doesn't want a single soul to perish. Instead, he put into action a plan of redemption to save us from evil, to restore us to his own perfect image so that we can again be received into heaven. However, this plan cost God the most precious thing to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. To meet the claims of a broken law, God sent his own Son to die in our place. Christ alone could lay down his life for us, and he did this willingly. The King of the universe gave up the glories of heaven to come to this world as a servant to save you and me from a punishment which we justly deserve. But Jesus came not only to save us from death, but to free us from our slavery to sin and addiction. He came to give us a life of freedom. I hope that as we see prophecy rapidly fulfilling, we will see our need for Jesus and use the time that we still have to develop a relationship with him. May we all look forward with joy to the very soon coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.